It's a discourse where a group of monks are going off to a foreign land. They come to say goodbye to the Buddha. And he says, have you said goodbye to Sariputta yet? He said, no, we haven't. He says, well, go say goodbye to Sariputta before you go. And so they go to see Sariputta. He says, with people in this place where you're going, if they ask you, what does your teacher teach, how are you going to answer them? And they say, well, we'd like to hear how you'd answer it. And so Sariputta's answer starts in an interesting way. He doesn't start with a general principle. He doesn't say life is suffering or any of those other things you usually hear are attributed to the Buddha. He starts with an activity. He says the Buddha teaches the abandoning of passion. And the next question, of course, is the abandoning of passion for what? For the five aggregates. The next question is, well, why does he teach that? What advantage does he see in this? Because if you ha have passion for these things, you're going to suffer. If you are able to abandon passion for them, you don't suffer anymore. And then he goes on to state a general principle that if in abandoning unskillful qualities you found suffering, the Buddha wouldn't teach it. But it's because through abandoning unskillful qualities you suffer less. That's why the Buddha teaches it. And the same with developing skillful qualities. If this led to suffering, he wouldn't teach it. But because it does lead to the end of suffering, that's why he teaches it. And the Buddha himself said at another point that if it were not possible to do this, he wouldn't teach it. But it is possible. We can abandon unskillful qualities, blameworthy qualities, and we can develop skillful ones in their place, blameless ones in their place. In other words, the teachings are all about things you can do. The Buddha doesn't say, well, be awakened or be free. He says, you do this and it will take you to awakening. It will take you to freedom. And he lays out the steps. The steps are not necessarily easy, but they can be done. And it's important to notice that he focuses you on things that can be done. He doesn't deal in vague abstractions. And he doesn't say, just be awake, be free, be patient, be these other things. He says, this is what you do. You can do this, and it will make you more patient. You can do this, and it will make you more free. So it's always important that we focus on what we can do, one, what we are doing, and looking to see where it's unskillful, and as the Buddha says, where it's blameworthy. That's an interesting concept. We don't think about it that much, but it's throughout the text. There are certain types of happiness that are blameworthy, and there are others that are blameless. Blameworthy in the sense that they cause suffering to other people, they cause harm to other people. And we're making our, making our happiness in the backs of other people, on top of their suffering. That's blameworthy. Blameless happiness is one that doesn't have to cause other people to suffer. It doesn't cause them any harm. So we have to take that dimension into consideration as well. So this is where you look. You look at your actions. Notice that when Sariputta is talking about the teaching, he starts out with something you can do, or a direction as to what you can do. He doesn't deal in abstract principles. You look at your thoughts, you look at your words, you look at your deeds. These are things that you can see, and these are things that you can have some power over. You can will yourself to be less harmful. An idea comes up in the mind, you can decide, am I going to think this idea or not? Or is it something better to steer clear of? And these are choices you're making all the time, and the Buddha says you can make them skillfully. I was reading recently of a new field in economics called behavioral economics. 
which unlike classical economics starts with the presupposition that people don't always act in their best interest. And you want to say, duh. You look all around you, people are always doing stupid things. This is what the Buddha is basically saying. He doesn't say life is suffering. He says people cause themselves to suffer. Now, yeah, they want happiness, but they don't do what's going to lead to their happiness. They actually do things that are going to make them suffer. And they do it again and again and again, and they wonder why they're suffering. And he's saying it's not mysterious. It's something you can actually look at. It's not some hidden power. There's no big force behind the scenes like the man in the, in the Wizard of Oz hiding behind the curtain pulling all the levers. There's no evil force. There's no good force acting through you. You're making the choices. And all the processes for the choices are right here, available for you to see. But you choose not to see. You've learned to push certain things out of consciousness, which doesn't mean that they go away or they disappear. They just go into the subconscious. The subconscious is not a particular area of the brain. It's more like certain choices that are being made and you're not paying full attention to them. It's not a separate force. It's just the choices that are being made under the radar. And you can change your radar so it can pick up these things. That's why we meditate. That's why we develop our mindfulness. We develop our alertness. And so you can bring more of these things into your conscious awareness. So that when you say something, you know why you said it. When you do something, you know why you did it. And at the same time, the Buddha gives you the confidence that you can change your ways and that you don't have to get tied up in knots over your mistakes. This is what the, the path is, a stepwise path. There are people in later centuries in the Buddhist tradition that heaped ridicule and abuse on the idea of a gradual path, saying that you can't get to something unconditioned by doing conditioned things. You can't get to the unfabricated by doing fabrications. That's directly contrary with the, to what the Buddha said. He said it is possible, and we have now know through studies of complex causality that really is possible that complex systems can contain the seeds for their own un undoing. You can use fabricated activity to get to the unfabricated. And the Buddha is simply saying, pay careful attention to how you do things, what choices you're making. And start on very simple levels. If you feel daunted by some of the practices, we'll back up a little bit and say, well, where do I, where can I get a handle on this? He starts with generosity. He starts with virtue. Meditation, the most common way of meditating is developing thoughts of goodwill, wishing for happiness. If you find that difficult, ask yourself, well, why? Do you not want to be happy? Do you resent other people's happiness? What do you gain from their unhappiness? Think these things through. When you spread thoughts of goodwill, it's not just radiating pink rays around the world. It's essentially going through the list of people you either know personally or you know of. Is there anybody out there that you really would like to see suffer? And you could probably come up with a list. And then you ask yourself, well, what do you gain from their suffering? What kind of pleasure, what kind of well-being would you gain from their suffering? And would they sit around just moaning and groaning, would that be it? Or would they go out and they do some really unskillful things to inflict more suffering than other people? Because it's usually the case when someone's been suffering, they'd like to spread it around a little bit. So the Buddha has you think in very basic ways. 
and not pretend that you feel goodwill for someone you don't. But he teaches you how to think in such a way that you really can honestly change your mind. This is important. The whole practice is about changing your mind by changing the way you act, bit by bit by bit, by the way you speak, by the way you think, the different thoughts you choose to think and not to think. And you find that by focusing on your actions, you really do become a different person. There's that passage, what am I becoming as days and nights fly past, fly past? What kind of person are you becoming through the way you choose to act? That's the question, basically. Then to change who you are, you don't go around readjusting the parts of you. You go around focusing on your actions. Like when we're sitting here right now with our eyes closed. You can be focusing on the breath, you can be focusing on Bhutto, you can be focusing on goodwill. Whatever is the object of thought that seems to be most congenial for the mind, most helpful in getting the mind to settle down, gain a sense of peace, well-being, sense of clarity. You can focus on the unattractiveness of the body. If you find that the body is a big issue, it requires a lot of thought to untangle that one. And it's an important one, because so much of our attachment is right there. But again, those attachments, it's not an abstract quality. It's a habitual way of acting. This is important. You look at these things in terms of actions. And each action that you do in a skillful way is a move in the right direction. Just wanting to act skillfully is a move in the right direction. And if you want it often enough, then you finally decide, well, I better get around and actually do something about it. And so you chip, chip, chip away at your actions. And that, without you really having to focus on it, you find that the kind of person you are changes. So sometimes you hear they say that the, the whole point of meditation is not to do, but it's to be. They're focusing on the results, but the actions, the results have to come from focusing on what you do. Each time you breathe in, you remind yourself, stay with the breath. That's a decision. That's a choice. And after a while it becomes easier. You don't have to keep reminding yourself. It's just a slight little note in the back of your head back of your mind. But it's there to keep reminding you, because you could change your mind at any point. You could focus someplace else. You could do something else. But you decide for right now you want to stay right here, right here, right here. And learning how to see the meditation as a kind of action is going to be very important all the way along, from the very beginning to the very end. Because there is that tendency when you get into deep stages of meditation that you think you've hit some ground of being, your true identity or the true nature of things, whether it's a sense of oneness, a sense of bright awareness, a sense of interconnectedness where your ordinary sense of self gets harder and harder to detect. And it's very easy to think that you've hit some sort of metaphysical principle, some abstract quality or principle of being. But the Buddha says, no, look at it in terms of what you're doing to stay there, what you did to get there, what you're doing to stay there. Continue looking at it as an action that's going to have a result. It's giving you results. Are the results steady? Is there any inconstancy there at all? If you can detect it, you say, oh, there's still some work to be done. There's still some stress going up, going down. It may be very subtle, but it's still there. There's more to do. This is the path of action all the way along, which makes it a good path, because if it were a path of Principles. What, how do we, you don't do a principle. You can't will a principle. It's something you can't really do at all. But you can do actions. You can choose.
to do something that's more skillful, less blameworthy. And nine times out of ten, uh, the more skillful choice is the obvious one. It's obvious what's skillful. There are a few cases where it's not so obvious, but you focus on the ones where it is obvious and you take care of a lot of problems. So it's important to remember the Buddha always has you focus on what you can do. You may be reading ahead in the book and thinking, wow, this gets pretty difficult. But again, you guys, you take it step by step. Okay, if you haven't mastered division, you haven't mastered multiplication, don't think about calculus. Go back and work on your multiplication tables. There's nothing demeaning about that. Other people may say, you're not awakened yet, and you say, okay, yeah, I'm not awakened yet. What other people say on that level doesn't really matter. You figure out where you need to work, what you're capable of doing, and you do it. And you find that your capacity grows because you focus on what you can do. So always keep this principle in mind. As with Sarabhuta started his discussion of what the Buddha taught, it was with an action. It recommends doing something. Now, abandoning passion, that's pretty far down the line. But you can learn how to abandon your passion for unskillful choices. You can begin on a level that you find possible. And as you work on what's possible and you work on what you can do, you find that your competence grows and your confidence grows. And whether it takes a long time or a short time, it doesn't matter. But you do find that at some point you are doing calculus. And it makes sense. It's nothing out of the ordinary. Even though it may have seemed impossible before. But it's by focusing on what's possible that you expand the level, expand the range of what's possible. And that's how the practice works.